open up for Wednesday night services beginning the first uh, Wednesday in June. Now that will, of course, depend on uh, the governor's uh, decisions between now and then, but that's the target date will be the first uh, Sunday, uh, Wednesday in June. So let's try to make that happen. But, of course, we have to make sure we stay safe and careful and everything else. Oh, we got the, thank you for the good sound. Thank you. This is working well. Um, many years ago, uh, when I was 12 years old, of all things, I was throwing newspapers. Actually, I started at 8. But I, a house, this guy named Walter Transo and his wife Margie uh, started renting a house on my route and started, started throwing them a newspaper. And they got to be friends. And what I found out was Walter at one time was a commercial fisherman for catfish. And so he took me fishing. We went to um, Anahuac on Turtle Bio and went fishing there. What, what he did, we don't go ride and reel, we did trot lines. So you tie it on this bank over here and take it over that bank and put weights on it with a whole bunch of hooks. So you get a lot more chances to catch fish than on just one little rod. And also we went down to Phillips Lake at West Columbia and went down fishing there and put our trot line in. And down at West Columbia, though, we caught our biggest catfish. It was a, a um, yellow uh, Opelousa, big old catfish, 36 pounds. Now, I didn't, I'm 5'11 now, but I didn't really grow until I was 14, and so when they held that fish up, it was bigger than me. So that was quite a fishing story. But I'm going to tell you a much bigger fishing story today that we can hold on to because there's a whole lot more to learn from this one than from mine. I'm talking how uh, Peter, James, uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were partners in a fishing operation up on Lake Galilee. It's also known as Lake Gezeret and Lake Sea of Tiberias and the uh, Sea of Galilee. It's all the same body of water. I've been on it in a boat before. Now, these men had gone out fishing. And they fished all night long. Now, they are professional fishermen. And they fish, and they fish, and they know where the fish are on that lake. They grew up there. And they worked hard all night, and they came up with what? Nothing. Nothing at all. Zap, zero. It's like James Harden playing a whole basketball game and can't find the basket. You know, he may kill cold for a while, but he's going to make some points. But these guys caught nothing at all. And they're supposed to be pros. As they're cleaning their nets, here comes this preacher. This Jesus comes along, and they're looking like, well, who is he? And so they're busy cleaning the nets, getting it ready to go out again because they're professionals. They've got to keep their equipment good. And lo and behold, Jesus looks at them and says, hey, um, I need to borrow your boat. Can you push me out in the water? And he says, sure. And so they pull him out. Now, why would Jesus ask to get in the boat? Well, if you're speaking, what happens? The ground absorbs your voice, it absorbs sound, but water reflects it. One time, um, I was looking at a house up here in Nantucket, and I thought, well, that's a beautiful view of the lake from behind the house. And so I opened the door, went outside, and all I could hear was Highway 6 rushing by. That, that lake, Nantucket, is a microphone of Highway 6, which amplifies the noise all the way up to those homes. So those homes may look nice on the lake, but sitting outside, not very pleasant. But it amplifies the sound. So Jesus could speak to a bigger crowd by being in the boat. And so he gets in the boat, and he teaches for a while. And um, then he finishes speaking, and he looks at his, these fishermen, and they're going, well... We, we're worn out and tired, but we're here. And look in Luke chapter uh, 5, verse 1. Uh, one day Jesus was standing on Lake Gazaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. And he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into the boat, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Now, he didn't pick that boat by random. Do you realize that? He had a reason to pick that boat. That's why he also has a reason to pick you for things. 
He saw in Peter what nobody else knew. He saw in Andrew what nobody else knew. Always bringing people to Jesus. He knew what James and John were, those sons of Zebedee, you know, sons of thunder, but how John would ultimately write the Revelation. He knew these people. He knew what they could do. They had no idea. They thought they'd just be fishermen the rest of their life. Now look over in Luke 5, verse 4. After Jesus finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now launch out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Well, you can hear the sadness and just desire. It just wasn't working. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. These guys don't realize they're getting ready to have a miracle in their midst. A miracle beyond their imagination. Now, they're looking at their lives, they go, we didn't close the deal. It's like many business people right now, and many people, by the way, who had jobs, have been laid off. And so it's kind of a frightening time. So these guys are very competent. They can do their job. And suddenly, there's, the work isn't producing any money. And you can be prepared. You can have all your certifications. You can have everything right. You can have your permits. But if you can't close the deal, you can't close the deal. And you cannot control the environment, you can't control the economy, and you can't control diseases. Isn't that true right now? Who would believe that oil would be, what, $10, $15 a barrel? Boy, give me some of that. Now it's going to go back up, but our economy is just kind of in a dizzy spell, especially if you're in oil and gas. But oil and gas affects everything else. So these guys not catching fish are in a quandary because... If they don't catch fish, they don't eat. And so that's a pretty long time to kind of wonder what we're going to do. We worked hard all night and caught nothing. But notice he says, I'll let down the nets. So he's looking at this. He says, you know what? I'm going to take a chance. Now look down at verse 6 and 7. When they did so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners, James and John, in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full with fish that they began to sink. You realize they catch more in 10 minutes than the last 10 days? You talk about a transformation. Everything is different because they let down the nets when Jesus told them to. So they, they're taking a setback and making to a big comeback. What, what a change in life that can be. You know, that's the understanding of the principle of acceleration. You say, what's that? When God wants to bless you, when God wants to open up doors, He generally doesn't make it just a little trickle. He generally opens the spigot wide open. Now, He opens that spigot wide open, but see... It's been a long time getting there. He's been working you to work and strengthen your faith. But when that door opens, you better get ready because the king can open that gate and he can accelerate the blessings like you never thought possible. Now, what do Peter, Andrew, James, and John need? Get this. I need to have Jesus in my boat in my business, in my life. Question for us, is Jesus in your boat? Is he with you? Are you putting him in charge of every area of your life? Because that's where the difference really comes. So let's look at this. What to do when you had not a business setback? And there's been a lot of setbacks all over. Now, I'm going to say we have, tend to have less setbacks here than other parts, but we still have a lot of setbacks. We have some people in this room who aren't feeling very good because they've had a big setback. And we're all hurting together through this. So what do you need to do? Give Jesus complete access to my business. Now, your business may be your job, may be your career, may be your company. And you say, well, I'm retired. Well, your business is to serve him, right? Now, you may be a professional golfer, but he's still in charge, right? Whatever it is. 
you're doing. Now look in Luke chapter 5, verse 3. Jesus got into one of the boats, the one belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from there. So he's asked somebody specifically, and Jesus knows what he's going to do with him. Now I want you to consider this. I must get Jesus in my boat. It's not enough for him to be in a boat. He needs to be in my boat. That's a starting point. It's awful simple. Now, so the starting point is God doesn't want you to just have him as your Savior. He wants to be in the midst of your job, in the midst of your career, in the midst of your business, whatever it may be. If you move with it empty of him, you won't have the fullness that God has for you. You'll shortchange yourself. Now, what's the difference here? They've been fishing all night, say 10 hours, caught nothing. Same fisherman, same boat, same net, same fish he's trying to catch. What's the difference between not catching fish and catching fish? Jesus. In their boat. So you need Jesus in the middle of what you're doing, not just asking him to bless what you're doing, but have him in the midst of what you're doing so that he can direct you and guide you what needs to be done. That's a game changer. Now further, my boat is... Now I wrote this out because I wanted you to look at this carefully and, and circle this. What I do to make a living. That's your boat. What I do to make a living. It may be selling products. It may be working, running equipment. You may be fixing equipment. You may be manufacturing something. You may be serving other people. I went out to a, a restaurant yesterday afternoon, and they were seating us way apart, and uh, the waiter came and brought my stuff, and I noticed the prices were higher than before, but I'm going, you know what? They, they need to make it, so you got more stuff, but you paid more than usual, and I said, that's fine. I, I want the restaurants to stay in business because later on I like to go out to eat every now and then. Uh, I don't want to eat my cooking. No, 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 no. Don't want to do that. Uh, so, what your boat is how you make a living. So that represents your career, your vocation, your business, whatever it may be. That is your boat. Now, you may get salaries, you may get commissions, you may get royalties, whatever it is. You may get your retirement check in. But that is your boat. And how you use your boat can change the world of other people and change your world as well. Now further, what does it mean to have Jesus in my boat? I want you to think about this a minute. What does it mean? I'm not talking about salvation. Salvation, though, is the beginning of having Jesus in your boat because you need to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, repent of your sins, and that's transform you. But you know, a lot of people... They accept Christ as Savior. Yes, they're going to heaven. They sing hallelujah Sunday morning. They have a great time, but Monday morning, they leave Jesus back at the church and they go on to work. And then they come back next Sunday and go, oh, I, I'm worn out. I, I need a refreshment from God. So they come back to church and they hallelujah again. But then they leave Jesus at the church and they go off to work. And they wonder why work is so hard, why work is such a drag, why their business never flourishes like they ever thought. Because they are leaving Jesus back at the church instead of putting him in their boat. Because if Jesus is in your boat, he'll give you wisdom how to make great business decisions. He'll give you wisdom how to make great career decisions. He'll give you wisdom how to be the best on the job you can be. But he's got to be in your boat, not back at the church. Yes, you're saved, but you're shortchanging everybody, including God, because God wants to bless you in that. Now, Peter had fished all night. And now he's blessed. Now, what does God want him to do? He wants to use Peter's boat as a platform to what? Share the gospel. And God wants to use your vocation, your business, your career to share the gospel. 
You say, well, I'm retired. Great, you've got more time. You've got other relationships. Use those relationships to share Christ. Now, some people go, I'm going to pray real hard. And God, I'm going to pray that God will bless my business. Then I'll start doing all this stuff for him. You got it backwards. You put God first. You say, well, my business isn't going well. My career, career isn't just what it wants to be. No, you got it wrong. You put God first in your boat. Let him direct you in your career. Let him direct you in your business and watch it flourish. And then you realize it's his and he's blessing you. What happens? He'll bless you greater than you ever thought possible. But he has got to be first. Otherwise, rather, you got it backwards. Now, also... Admit my efforts aren't working. That's a tough one for a man. We never want to admit our efforts aren't working. No way. But you know what? I've got to admit that at times. I work hard, I try hard, I'm putting everything in, but sometimes I've got to step back and say, uh, God, uh, I need more direction. I, I messed up on the plan. I need to get back where I'm supposed to be. So admit my efforts aren't working from Luke 5, verse 4. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now launch into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've been working hard all night and haven't caught anything. So you realize Peter's a pro. Us other guys are amateurs. Believe me, I'm an amateur fisherman. So that's his career. And yet, it's not working. He knows every detail about the lake. He knows where the fish are supposed to be, and they're hiding from him. It's very humbling for a man to admit, hey, it's not working. I, I need help. You know what? There's a lot of... We like to think we control everything. There's really very little we really control. We don't control the economy. We don't control diseases. We don't control when we're born, and we don't control when we die. So we only have a small sliver of things we have control of. And so we need to make sure what God has given us, that we make good decisions there and look at it very carefully. So regardless of your pride and everything else, you need to come to God and say, God, it's not working as I need it to. I need your help. And invite him in to your Business, your career, your vocation, whatever it is, how you serve. Now, now, now so how, how are we holding back? Consider this. Is it our pride? Is it our stubbornness? Or is it fear? A lot of people are fearful to admit things aren't working out because they don't want anybody else to know that they're messing up. Or, or is it just, hey, you're just plain stubborn. You know, if somebody hits you in the head with a hammer, the hammer would break. Yeah, have you met some of those people? Yeah, I have. They can keep doing what they're doing. You know, the definition of insanity is keep doing what you're doing but expecting different results. Now, if it's not working, you need to back up and change something. And what about pride? Oh, we don't want anybody else to know we're not perfect. You know, like you ask the typical person around here, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. They may be doing dreadful, but they're fine, Right? That's our stock answer, right? Everything's good while we're crumbling inside. You know what? God knows where we are. So just think where you might be. Now, three, do whatever Jesus tells me to do. Do whatever what Jesus tells me to do. You know, sometimes God's going to tell you to do something, you go, well, that doesn't add up. I have figured that out. I have done the math problem. It doesn't work. I have figured it out. That will be a disaster. Now, I will tell you this. God will never tell you to do anything that's different than what the Bible says. So if it's something to do something stupid that violates the Bible, that's sin, you know that's from the devil and just discard that. But sometimes God will tell you to do something that looks absolutely crazy on the surface. Just like when God called me to preach. He said, now sell my business and serve him. You go, right. 
The economy's great. It's 1981, October, in Houston. The economy is just fabulous. And so I do it. What happens in 1983 in Houston? The bottom fell out of the market. I'm in school at Houston Baptist University working on cars to pay my way through school, and I have no debt, and I can work so I can have income, and I'm fine. If I had not obeyed when it didn't make sense, because I argued with God, well, why can't I just lease my building so it'd pay the note? I would have had to leave college to pay the note on a building. And its value didn't recover for 20 years. Yeah. So when God tells you to do something, obey. Just obey. Just do it. Don't, don't try to figure it all out because God has a much better perspective than we do. Do whatever he tells you to do. You know, it's, frankly, sometimes it's illogical. Sometimes you say, I can't afford it. It appears crazy, but that's okay. In Luke 5, 5, Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. So here's this third key about a miracle is don't think you're smarter than God. Don't think you're smarter than God. Now consider this. Peter could have easily kind of bowed up and said, hey, Jesus, uh, I know you're really good at speaking, and I heard you're a tremendous carpenter, but I'm the fisherman. I know where the fish are. I know where we can catch them. I know how big they are. I know just everything to do. But he didn't do that. But see, we're good at that, aren't we? we I have countless people through the years tell me, Oh, God told me to do it, and I didn't do it. Oh, I wish I'd done it. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. When you say, God is my Savior, He's the ruler of the universe, He has all of my concerns at His heart, He loves me, and He tells me to do something, and I go, flippantly, I'm not going to do that. Well, why not? Just follow through. Do what He says and you'll be surprised what things will happen for you. You know, here's also another thing about it. Peter didn't hesitate. Now, he said, uh, we worked hard all night, but add your word, we're going to do it. So they push out and put down the nets. Do it without hesitation. In fact, the more you think through it, the, the less likely you're going to do it. Just push out. God says, do it, just get on out there. Don't hesitate. Unquestioned obedience to your God. And you say, well, how can you do that? You need to pray daily. You need to read your Bible daily. So when it's time for to make a decision, you don't sit there and stumble, well, where's that voice from? You've learned God's voice by being with Him every single day, and so when the time comes to make a decision, Unquestioned obedience, you know God's word. Back in verse 4 of Luke 5. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now launch out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. So when? Circle, now launch out. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, If you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. If you wait till everything is just right, just perfect, what happens? You won't do anything. Because no conditions will ever be perfect. You've got to trust God and launch in on faith. There's always a risk when you launch out. See, when you launch out, you get exposed. You may fail. And if you fail, people may give you a hard time about it. It may cost you money. Say, well, I don't want to leap out in faith. That's where the fruit is. And the more God stretches you to step out in faith, the greater your faith grows. And next, he says, let down your nets. Now, there's a time when you've got to say, okay, I'm going to invest in this, and I'm going to put down my nets and trust God's going to catch something. That's always hard. You know, are, are there any jobs there? You've got to let down your nets. 
Well, I've tried this. I've gotten a little tired. Well, let down your nets. Well, I don't know if they like people with my certifications. Don't matter. Let down your nets. You might be surprised who will need you in a job. You might be surprised who needs what you're trying to sell. You never know. Let down your nets. But if you don't let down your nets, you won't catch anything. Now, where are you going to do it? Circle deep water. See, why, why not shallow water? Well, if you just want to catch little minnows, go ahead and go in the shallow water. I don't know about you, but I want the biggest blessing God has for me, so I'm going to get out in the deep water, and I'm going to try to catch the biggest blessing I can. What do you think? Don't shortchange yourself. Now, what's God told you to do that you haven't done? You know, God's told you maybe you've accepted Christ, but you haven't gotten around to get baptized yet. Well, why not? That's the first step of obedience in serving God is to follow him in baptism. Are you serving in your church? You say, well, I show up. No, I ask you, are you serving in your church? There's a big difference between serving and showing up. You need to be serving and being active and making a difference in the church. You know, as somebody, you need to forgive. You know, forgive them. Maybe you need to start tithing. You say, well, it, it, money is tight right now. Well, you need to be tithing now, trusting God that he'll provide for you. Number four, expect God to turn things around. Expect it. Don't wish and hope. Expect it because we serve a great God. That's the faith factor. You must trust him to do what he says he's going to do. Do you really trust him? You think about this. Peter just says, at your word, I'm going to let down these nets. I'm going to go out in the deep. I wonder, he's going, you know what? I really like what he had to say. Maybe there's something to this. And he goes and puts down the net, and his anticipation is overwhelming what happens. You know, fear and frustration and fatigue cost many people from not doing what they should. They're fearful, they're fatigued, they're worn out, they're frustrated. Peter had all of those as well as Andrew, James, and John. But it didn't matter to them. They did what they were asked to do. They were not afraid of failing. You know what? If you want to see God do great things, you've got to see it before you actually see it or it'll never happen. You've got to believe that God will do it without ever having it in hand. You know, an atheist can lead a church if you wait until you have all the money in the bank before you do anything. That's no problem. It takes faith to launch out and say, I'm going to leap in faith and trust God's going to provide. Consider this in Luke 5, 6, and 7. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled their boats so full that they began to sink. You know, what, what do we need to do? We need to admit what our plans aren't working. Their, their plan of fishing just wasn't working. And see, you're supposed to try to fish at night. And now Jesus tells them during the day. And lo and behold, that worked. But our plans, their plans didn't work. They had to get a new perspective. And Jesus gave that to them, and so now they launched out, and here's the blessing. So that was the beginning of turning a setback into a big comeback. And so now they're making a big comeback. We know what? They are not going to be the same people that started fishing that day. You realize that? Totally changed forever. They caught a large number of fish. The blessings were there. But now notice verse 8. Something happens. Peter's reaction. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell to Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. So were James and John and the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Remember, he's not a disciple yet. He's thinking about it. He's a fisherman. He says, go away, you're, you're perfect. 
I've been a fisherman a long time. I've never seen this. It's you, not me, catching these fish. And when God starts blessing you, you're going to realize it's not you, it's him that's providing all that to you. This is a turning point for these men. Their lives will be transformed. Look in Luke 5, verse 10. The real, this is the real lesson of, the, of this day. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats on the shore, and they left everything and followed Jesus. So the miracle is not about possessions. It's not about money. It's not financial success. It's not about success in business. It's about putting God first, that he's in charge of your boat. Jesus, notice, they don't clean the fish. I don't know about you, but if I caught a whole bunch of fish, I'd make sure they got clean. But they realize it's not about fish. It's not about their business. It's about God. And their lives were transformed. Now, what does God want you to do? Every one of us has a different set of skills and abilities and opportunities. And every one of us has a choice to accept Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior or not. So we make that decision first. And then we need to make the second decision. Is Jesus going to be the captain in charge of my boat? Or am I going to be in charge of my boat and, he, and he's got my salvation, but that's all I'm going to get? Don't shortchange yourself. Put Jesus in control of your boat. So the disciples now make that transformation. They're now following him. And we need to make sure we follow him and place him in charge of our lives. Consider. They could have gone, wow, look at all this fish. We can sell these and we'll have enough money for the next 10 years. We are rich. No. They were more concerned about the blessor than the blessing. So much time we get tied up and praying for this. We want this blessing, this blessing, this blessing. No. Seek the blesser. Psalms 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You delight in God. You focus on him. You let him be in charge of your boat, your life, your business, your occupation, your job, and let him show you how to live. You know, God calls us in two directions. One, sometimes he calls us to be in his ministry as a pastor, and other, he calls us to be in the marketplace in ministry. He does both. And some of us, he puts us in both departments. It's amazing. My challenge to you is use your platform, your job, your career, your business, as a vehicle to share others Jesus as Savior. To use your influence to bless other people, to bless your church, to make a difference in this world. Think about this. What if the disciples had gone the other way? Oh, this is a great kiss. Thank you so much, Jesus, for blessing us with these fish. We'll see you later. Peter wrote two books in the Bible. John wrote John, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the Revelation. Andrew kept on bringing people to Jesus. And James was always there with his brother until he was beheaded by Herod. Our lives were changed because these men followed Jesus. What lives can you change because you follow Jesus? And make him the captain of your boat. Make sure he's there. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being for us today. We know that we all need to come back. This world has gone the wrong way, and we want to come back to you and make a difference. Help us, Father, to take hold of this moment and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.